Isn't it amazing to think in just a few short days we'll be seeing the Lord face to face? Isn't that awesome? That we will literally be worshiping with billions of people. You know, I've found that I get chills when I get in a football stadium and 90,000 to 100,000 people begin to cheer. It gives me goosebumps because the people are in unity. But imagine what happens in heaven when you've got every saint of God in perfect unity that no one deserves glory but him. And when we start putting our voices together in song and in worship, you talk about goosebumps that's going to step on top of other goosebumps. <laughs> Amen. You're going to have a feeling like you've never had before. Amen. <laughs> God really started talking to us today, and I was just itching to share some things with you this morning. God uh, wouldn't allow me yet, but tonight I believe that he's going to allow me to share some golden nuggets from the word that you're going to grow from for receiving this. We just want to pray right now. And uh, believe that God's going to anoint his servant, anoint his word, as always, and that he'll allow you to hear what he's wanting to say. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we are in awe of you. For Jesus, there's been times I've been in crowds of four to five, 10,000 people, and there's been times I've been in crowds of 15. But God, when you were there, that was the most important thing. You are here tonight, Lord. We feel you. We know you're here. And I, I know that when you show up, there's always a reason. There's something you're wanting to say, to do. God, manifest your Holy Spirit tonight, and I pray that thy will will be accomplished in this place. And we give you thanks and glory and honor forever in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Anybody ready for a T-bone? T-bone steak in the Lord. Baked potato to go with it, I heard. The mantle has exchanged hands. We left off this morning. I'm going to pick back up with 1 Kings chapter 19. We'll start reading, actually with, uh, I believe, verse 20 is where I'm going to pick it up. You know, we were talking this morning about Elijah calling Elisha. Now, that gets a little confusing, uh, but just remember, J becomes be comes before S in the alphabet, so maybe Elijah, you'll be able to remember, was before Elisha. So here we have a man of God, a prophet who has done many miracles through God's power, and the Lord speaks to him, and he says, I want you to go and anoint uh, Hazael, uh, king of Syria. I want you to go anoint Jehu, king of Israel, and I want you to anoint, uh, I almost forgot his name, himself, Elisha as the prophet in your place. So three different people God instructs Elijah to go and anoint. But one in particular we find Elijah puts the mantle on, and it is none other than Elisha. God instructed us this morning that he has placed a mantle on this ministry. And there is a purpose that we are coming together after over five and a half years and we're still working for the kingdom. It's because we are not under man's or woman's mantle. We're under the mantle of God Almighty. And if we'll stay under that mantle, God's going to do mighty things. Beginning with verse 20. It says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? Elijah did not say one word about the ministry or the calling that was being put on Elisha's life, but some, somehow, as Elijah put the mantle on Elisha, he recognized this is different from a king's anointing. This is different from an anointing of someone who maybe comes up and they want a little sprinkle or a little blessing. I've had the mantle placed upon me and I want you to know as the bride of Christ on this earth that God's given you more than just a blessing some people that's all they want is just a blessing they'll say I need favor in a situation well that's good to want it but please don't let that be the final thing you ask for because what God's wanting to put on his people is a holy mantle that is anointed and is available to break every yoke of bondage amen God's mantle is available to us he asked what have I done to you Many times God will ask us a question when he's provoking us to think of our own answer. Let's move on with verse 21. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. I told you we was going to get into some T-bone. Hallelujah. And they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. So let's look at this and see what God did through the placement of the mantle. 
Before Elisha could truly walk in his calling, he had to break up with the yoke. He had to break up with something that he found comfort and reliability in. This plow reckon, reckon, um, represented, I'm going to get it right in a minute, it represented income. There's a lot of things in our lives that bless us. They lead to income coming in, and I think everyone in the building knows you need some kind of income if you're going to live in America. Amen? Unless you're going to live off uh, weeds and some kind of bushes growing wildly and hang out in the cave. It's kind of difficult. <laughs> Amen? We've got to have income. Elisha had income from the plow and from the oxen and from what he grew. But he had to break up with what was comfortable. Some of you have already been feeling a little bit of discomfort as we are shifting into relaunching this ministry. You're being pressed. You're being changed. You're being asked to do different things than you've been asked to do before. And that is not fun. Because if you're like me, I'm a creature of habit, and I like getting uh, in a format and sticking with it. Amen. Why is that that I like that? It's because I get comfortable. And brother bro, I love being comfortable. But God will not allow us to remain comfortable. Amen. And I would guarantee you, Colton, India, and all you others, in about five more years, if that long, God's going to do it again. And he's going to shift us again, and we're going to be like, oh, my goodness, we're going to do it again. Well, praise God. He's got his hand on us, and he's pushing us to expand our territory. Amen. We'll never get that property over there and never build another church and never run 500 to 5,000 people if we just keep doing the same thing we've always done. We'll have 50 happy people, and we'll shout the victory, and we'll have Holy Ghost count meeting and see one or two saved every couple of months, and praise God for that. But if you really want to see what God has put inside the heart of this church, then we're going to have to stretch, amen, and do some things that feel unorthodox and we're not used to. But if God is in it, God will bless it. So what did he do? He broke up with a yoke. He broke that yoke up and used it as firewood. He was making a statement to everybody in town, I'm not coming back to this place. How easy it could have been to just pack up the yoke and stick it in the barn and say, well, Daddy, if I get upset, if Elijah rubs me the wrong way, if Elijah tells me to clean the toilets at the church, and I don't feel that's up to my calling, keep that yoke handy because I'm coming back and I'll get right back in this field. He didn't do that. He didn't really know everything Elijah was going to teach him or ask him to do, but he knew this. As long as that yoke's still left in the barn, it's packed up and it's put up nicely, I'll always have something I can run back to if I get uncomfortable. But he made up his mind, I will not, I refuse to come back to this place. I won't come back to this field. And I want you to picture this. If you've been working in a field for years, you know every square foot of that field. You know where rocks sometimes have been. You've had to dig them up. You know where weeds have a tendency to grow and where a stream sometimes will try to make its way down a certain corner of the field. You know this because you've grown accustomed to working that field. There's a lot of places in our lives right now that we have grown accustomed and we've learned about those areas. And we say, hey, I know how to handle this. But what's uncomfortable is when God picks you up out of that field and he says, now that you've learned every square foot, I'm going to put you in a place you've never been before and you've got to start all over learning again. That's not fun. But praise God, he trusts you to make the journey. Amen? He gets us out of our safe place. When Elijah laid the mantle on Elisha, it gave Elisha the opportunity to annihilate his yoke. I love this fact about God, that when he begins anointing you, it is never to make you comfortable with your lack of success. It is never to make you thrilled with your failures or your shortcomings. The anointing that rests upon you forces you to recognize the error of your ways. See, there's, I've said this before from this pulpit, but sometimes there'll be people who flow, and it, feels, it seems like they're flowing in the anointing, and they've got maybe a major sin in their lives. And, and people say, well, I guess God approves of it because things are happening in their ministry. But here's what I found about the anointing. The anointing never condones sin. It's always it's always pushing you to remove sin from your life. Amen. So if someone remains in sin, but they, they, they see many souls saved or, or God do things in their ministry, it's not because God condones sinful behavior. It's that he's given them the opportunity to crush that sin that is plaguing them before it's too late and hell becomes their home. Oh, oh, oh think about that now. Wait a minute. So don't judge people based on how anointed you think they are or what you see happening in their ministry. Look at the fruit of their life because that's what God looks at. Elijah's mantle was not an approval on how straight Elisha plowed the field. 
It was a mantle that would separate him from the field. Elisha could have felt that mantle on his shoulder and said, Ooh, this means I'm doing a good job. I've got God's approval for how I'm plowing. That's got to be why Elijah showed up here. He's come to tell me I'm the greatest farmer in all of Israel. Woo-hoo, hallelujah. No, the mantle was to separate him from what he thought he was successful at. He had to step into something that he had no experience doing, and that was being a prophet. That's what God does in our lives many times. He'll say, I need you to step away from that that you think I'm, I'm bragging on you about, but he says, I'm actually placing the anointing on you to separate you from what you're proud of. Think about that. When you decided that you were going to follow God's will for your life and you would begin or you would be a part of New Haven Church of God, even in the past few years, there's been some areas of our lives we've had to let God change. We've had to step away from certain behaviors. How many are glad you're not the same person you was when you first came here? Oh, hallelujah. That ought to make somebody shout. Woo! Glory to God. I am not the same. I can say that. I'm not the same person as I was when I became pastor and we started this church. The mantle provoked Elisha to make contact with fire. You better watch out. 1 Kings 19, verse 21, second part of that verse says, He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. When you get in contact with the anointing, you can never stay far away from the fire. Man, that's why there's uh, people that are in this church if we go for a couple of weeks and the Holy Ghost don't move, you're going to hear about it. You're going you're gonna to have somebody come into the pastor and say, Pastor, we're going to have to do something. Somebody's going to have to start fasting and praying again. We, we ain't having an old-time Holy Ghost count meeting. Something's got to change, amen. The reason that our church continues to burn hot with fire is because there are people sitting in the pews who refuse, Woo, glory to God, who refuse to get cold. Oh, See, there's folks in here, my Lord, help me. There's folks in here that, and I, I've talked to this praise team before, but there'll be times we look out here like tonight, I'm sorry, uh, like other times, <clears throat> and, and sometimes people just, you know, they're kind of staring at you. Maybe it's not one of those, like, wow, glory. you got people running all over the church. Maybe it's not one of those services, but there's times where we're singing and, and we're feeling something up here, but maybe people looking at us, they might not sense the same thing, and we just go ahead and made up our minds, Brother Neil. We're just going to have church anyway. Amen? Hallelujah. Me and Brother Gary and other ministers have talked about this. Sometimes you will preach and you feel such anointing, you feel like your skin's going to pop off your bones. And, and people stare at you. And you might get an amen every five minutes, and you think, what's going on with these people? But here's what I found. When God's anointing is on you, don't worry about the response. Preach like you've never preached in your life. Amen. Because somebody's going to be touched by the seed that you're planting. Amen. Don't worry about responses. But the reason we keep having, bro, Holy Ghost count meeting in this building week after week, months, years, is because there are praying saints of God who don't just set aside time during three hours on Sunday to pray. They don't wait till Wednesday at 6.30 to say, oh, I just, I'm, I'm going to start praying. There are people in this building who seek the face, not just the hand, but you seek the very face of God, and because of your faithfulness, the Lord has continued to save souls in this place. He's continued to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. Amen. He's continued to move on people to join this great church because of your prayers. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Do you believe that? Oh, hallelujah. There's two things that I want to point out, and I'm jumping all over the place, Elizabeth, so you just hang with me. Let's go back to 1 Kings 19, if you can find that, verses 11 through 13 on the screen. 1 Kings 19, verses 11 through 13. There's something very important I wanted to point out. I was going to get to it this morning, but we saw how God moved. When this mantle was placed on Elisha's shoulder in the field, there was something very dramatic that had happened in the last few hours involving this mantle. It wasn't just a piece of cloth somebody picked up at J.C. Penney's. Oh, I've been to Sears, Elisha. You ain't going to believe what kind of deal I got on this mantle. Just picked it up yesterday. No, this was a mantle that had experienced the presence of God. For you see, a few hours before when Elisha 
when Elisha has no idea, is about to be a prophet. Elijah's running from Queen Jezebel. I don't have time to get into all this, but there was a showdown on Mount Carmel, and he called, Elijah called down fire from heaven, killed the prophets of Baal, slew them with a sword. The queen didn't like it because that was the religion she was promoting. So she issued a decree that you're going to be dead in the same way that my prophets were killed. You'll be killed. And so Elijah flees for his life. And he goes hiding out in a mountain of all places called Mount Horeb, which is the exact same place where that Moses had an encounter with God and the fiery burning bush. But that's for another time. Now we see Elijah on this same mountain range. And God begins to speak to Elijah. Verse 11, then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And before the Lord passed by, <clears throat> and a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. I need to make a, a really important point right here. <clears throat> the last day's church is going to be tested more than probably any era of the church. We must be able to discern between carnal ways, between demonic activity, and between divine acts of God. Now you've got a pastor and you've got several leaders in this church that we seek the Lord continually about discernment so that we will not be thrown off course or deceived by any person or anything. But you are as part of the bride of Christ, must also have that discernment. Because there'll be times that your pastor and other leaders are not around you. You'll be at work, you'll be at home, or somewhere else. And you need to be able to discern what is of God and what is not. Elijah recognized that as awesome as this wind and, and all these earthquakes and things were, that God wasn't moving in those things. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Have you ever heard that voice? Anybody in this room? You ever heard that voice in your heart, your soul? Verse 13, so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle. Now, y'all won't be able to hear me preach too good if I wrap my face, <clears throat> but you get the picture. He wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Two different supernatural things had taken place. <clears throat> With this mantle. First of all, when Elijah, who was wearing the mantle, heard God's voice and he heard God moving, the Bible says that he covered his face, wrapped his face with this mantle. The mantle that was about to go on to Elisha temporarily had been wrapped around the face of the prophet of God. <clears throat> Let me look, get a little personal because I know y'all like getting personal sometimes. The word of God <clears throat> for New Haven is wrapped in prophecy. The anointing of God for New Haven Church of God is wrapped in prophecy. I've got page after page after page, and we've added about three or four today where God spoke to us this morning, where that God has prophetically given us a word. He said, I'm wrapping my church in an anointed prophetic word. We've had preachers come through this building and revivals. We've had uh, your pastor and other teachers and preachers that have stood before you, and they've spoken anointed prophetic word. God has wrapped this ministry in the prophetic. Amen. The mantle that would be placed on Elisha had been wrapped around the face of Elijah. Why is that important? Well, we go to Isaiah 6, verse 3, and it tells us something about reverence. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. This was in heaven. The angels, the seraphim, they flew around the throne room and worshiped God. But the Bible says even though in all their holiness and their uh, closeness to God, even they covered their faces. When you approach God, you must approach him with reverence. The mantle that is being placed on New Haven Church of God and on the Bride of Christ worldwide right now is connected to reverence. We've talked about reverence many times. Reverence can... Uh, be carried out in a lot of ways. It can be based on uh, you see a piece of trash on the carpet when you walk in the church, and instead of saying, oh, I'll let somebody else do it, or that's not my job to clean, you bend over and you pick it up if you're physically able. That's reverence for the house of the Lord. could be like one church where I went and preached, and they walked in with a hamburger and a, a Coke, 
sat down on the front pew and sat there and popped open the drink, started eating. And I was like, God, help me. I'm not the pastor here, so I got to be careful. But to me, that was not a sign of reverence to be eating a Big Mac while I'm preaching the gospel. Amen. At least not in the house of the Lord. I say, well, you might sit there and watch it on TV sometimes and eat your Big Mac. I guess it's okay. But anyway, I believe there are levels of reverence. I believe when God's Holy Ghost starts moving, uh-oh, don't you wish sometimes everybody was here to hear this? Lord, help me. I believe when the Holy Ghost is moving, nobody's to get up and walk out. No one's to stand or sit unless it's uh, to worship. No one is to talk when the Holy Ghost gives out a message in tongues and interpretation. Amen. Well, all music stops because it is a divine appointment between us and God. There's many areas. Boy, I got this thing wrapped around me good. There's many areas of reverence. Now, I don't want anybody to feel condemned over what I'm about to say, but for Michael Knight, I feel that I'm not supposed to set a Coke can on the Holy Bible. Now, again, that's me. You know, there's different people think different things. But to me, reverence is not to set things on top of God's Word. Now, listen, we're not going to get legalistic and tell you what you can and can't do unless it's black and white in the Bible. But I'll just tell you, there's things that God moves on you about that is reverence. <clears throat> and there's ways that we need to conduct ourselves. The anointing, the mantle that's placed upon us is going to change our behavior so that when the world comes in, they don't see themselves in a mirror, that they'll see the church and not themselves because we are not of this world. Amen. We are set apart. We are a holy people. And when the world sees us, we want them to see Jesus. Second thing, it said a voice came to him. While this was wrapped around his face, a voice came to him. How did he hear unless the word pierced the very mantle that was wrapped around his face? The mantle that was placed on Elisha had been pierced by the living holy word that is sharper than a two-edged sword. You see, no mantle is worth anything when it comes to ministry unless it's been touched by the word itself. We could do great things. We could go out and like we're going to get the fruit baskets for Southside High School staff. We could do a lot of good things. We can fill up buildings by promoting certain agendas or, 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 or carrying out certain plans that help grow a church. And we might do good in, at that. But what's going to change people's hearts is when you touch them with the word and with the anointing. See, a lot of people can leave church every week feeling good, but I want them to leave living good. Hallelujah. A lot of people can come and they can leave thinking better of themselves, but I want them to leave thinking better about Jesus and to live like him. That is the mandate that's been placed on the church. God has given us a mantle that's drenched in his word. Got your seatbelt on, Neil? If you don't, you're about to run. I want to show you some things the word of God can do when it passes through your mantle. Number one, the words, let there be light. Force darkness to step aside and allow the beauty of God's light to have dominion over all creation. The words dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Cause the bones of an army to rise out of the dirt and to come together. The words peace be still that came out of Jesus' mouth while he stood on a boat caused the power switch to the winds and the waves to be cut off. The words Lazarus come forth caused a dead corpse to leave a tomb and it forced death to put the vacancy sign back on the door. The words, little girl, I say to you arise, caused the dead girl of a synagogue ruler to come alive. The words, rise, take up your bed and walk, caused a man who was sitting by the pool of Bethesda to stand up and be healed. And the words, it is finished, ushered in the complete devastation of Satan's plans to rule through death. Somebody give God a hand of praise. The, the mantle that is truly anointed is a mantle that is touched by the word of God. Just through these few examples, I wanted to show you how powerful the word of God really is. The word of God can turn everything around. God has spoken to us so many times. And there's a word directly to us, and it's, it's actually right out of this scripture I'm going to read tonight. But it's for every Christian including New Haven Church of God. You're welcome to turn with me to John chapter 14, verse 12. John chapter 14, we're going to verse 12. The great works that took place in Elisha 
only took place when Elijah went up to the Father. I briefly mentioned this morning. <clears throat> we'll get to John 14 in just a moment. That right before Elijah went up into a, uh, in a whirlwind into heaven, in a chariot of fire, that Elijah had taken the mantle and he struck the waters of the Jordan. And right before Elijah and Elisha's eyes, the waters went to the right and went to the left. And the Bible says they didn't walk by, they didn't go through and put on their uh, Timberlake boots and they didn't have to put on their galoshes. The Bible said they walked on dry ground. Mm, sounds a little like, a bit like a Red Sea moment to me. He strikes the Jordan. And the waters part to the right and to the left. But as soon as Elijah lifts up in that chariot, and Elisha had said, I want a double portion. Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing, but just be with me when I'm carried up. It's going to be done unto you. And the Bible says that that mantle fell from the sky, and Elisha caught it after he had rent his clothes. Now, I want you to picture this. A mantle can be used for a lot of things. Mantle can be used as a garment of mourning. We're going to go somewhere, so I hope somebody's praying. You could be in a mantle of mourning saying, I'm never going to be what my mentor was. Elijah was a great man of God. I could never match what he did. People will never look at me the way they looked at him. I don't know how I'm going to be able to study the, the Torah, the, the law of God. I don't know how I'm going to be able to stand against Ahab and all of them. I don't know what I'm going to do. But instead of it being a garment of mourning, Eli Elisha made a decision. I'm going to let it be a garment that continues the legacy of my mentor. He could have worn it like this. Am I on camera? I'm not on camera. He could have let it be a cape like a hero. He could, say, he could have said the opposite of what I just mentioned. Oh, I'm the man now. I'll be the one that everyone looks to. Don't know how long uh, my ministry will last, but when I'm around, people are going to honor me, and I'm going to have 15 ushers around me, and I'm going to take up offerings, and God's going to bless my income, and it's all going to be about what I can accomplish. The mantle could have become the cape of a hero. But instead, he said, I'll show you what I think about this mantle. It's not for mourning. It's not to uh, say, woe is me, because the former generation's been removed, and now it's all up to me. It wasn't for a hero, hero complex, so that everyone would notice who we were. Somebody here's where I'm going now. I got a grandmother that very few people that are on earth today even remember her name. But God knows her. Because she left a legacy that continues through this boy right now. We called her Mama, but her name was Louise Jeffers. But God knew her as his daughter. She never stood before Alabama State Camp meeting and sang in a quartet. But her grandson did. She never attained a bishop's license and went through the whole process, three, four, five years, six years of studying. But she invested in prayer, and her grandson did. She never pastored a church. But five and a half years ago, her grandson, walking on her prayers, with the help of God, planted a church when he had never pastored a church in his life. And tonight, we're still going strong because of a woman, just one example, not the only reason, but because of a woman named Louise Jeffers that most people have that especially in this church, have never even heard her name. But God knew her name and knows her name. And because of her faithfulness, at least one young man stands in this building tonight preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of her grandsons and, and others connected with her became involved in ministry. Others pastored, remember one that we just lost within about a year ago, Ken Hendricks from Houghton Church of God, passed away in a, because of a, an accident. But over and over, when we get together at family meetings and we have Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know what we do a lot of times? We'll sit there and somebody says, why don't we sing What a Lovely Name? Why don't we sing Amazing Grace? How about we sing a song of praise unto God? You know what happens? My Aunt Mary Richardson. Anybody know Mary Richardson? I don't know how many of you do. Holy Ghost to get a hold of that woman. 
we'll sit there. We've just opened a bunch of gifts, and the kids are having fun with their, their new flip-flops or their new slingshots or whatever they're playing with, remote control cars, and Aunt Mary will go to singing, and she'll start speaking in tongues. A lot of people who might be sitting there, or I should say outside the house, they probably don't even know about Louise Jeffers. But because of Louise Jeffers' prayers, Aunt Mary still gets touched by the Holy Ghost at a Thanksgiving or a Christmas dinner or July 4th celebration. And we have church over and over and over. We could sit down because my uncle, who was pastoring at age 41, I believe it was, passed away far too early in 1990, and it just devastated a whole community and a whole church, and the church kind of almost fell apart. Or we can thank God that the Lord sent my family, my dad, to that same church, and now they're in one of the biggest, most beautiful churches in the entire area. And the name of the church is Safe Harbor Church of God. And every week they're ministering to about double the size church that my uncle ever had. We couldn't foresee that when he died, but God knew if we would keep moving forward instead of laying down in our mourning, that he would use us. I went to a wedding yesterday, Rachel's sister, Crystal, and Brett. They've started coming to our church quite a bit. And I looked on the table, and I saw a picture of their handsome dad. What was his first name? James. Handsome guy. I'm going to tell you, he looked like Elvis Presley or something. Right? He could have been a movie star. I love that picture they had on that table. What year did he pass away? 2000. That's still fresh. I still feel the pain of 1990 of my uncle. 2000 is a whole lot closer than that. I looked in his eyes, and I said, oh, I can see his girls. I can see him and his girls. It was awesome. And as I began thinking more, even during the wedding, I thought, now let's think about this just a moment. Here is a man who was sold out to Jesus. Here's a man who, now, was he a preacher? He was a preacher. What about a singer? Singer and a preacher, anointed by God Almighty. But we feel like he was taken too soon. We feel that way. But Rachel and Crystal and Kelly, Angie, Wendy, is that all of them? Made a decision, even though the, ro the road was rough, they made a decision, we won't lay down and quit. You've got a girl that stands up here week after week whose dad is not within a phone call. She can't text him. She can't email him. She cannot go visit him until Jesus comes back. And yet, instead of making the decision, well, my dad's gone, I might as well just sit down and quit. She takes that mantle. Ooh, I feel it. And when that girl gets a hold of this mic and the Holy Spirit begins moving through her, see, some of you don't realize the pain that she experienced during those early years. She was young, but she made a decision, I won't die in my pain. I won't quit because I lost someone who was so precious to me. And when she takes this mic and we sing songs like It Is Well and the Holy Ghost gets a hold of Rachel and she starts, I call it preaching. She exhorts the people and God begins to move and I can hardly sit on that keyboard without just falling out in the Holy Ghost. It's in those moments where that Rachel is taking the mantle and saying, where is the God of my daddy? Elisha, when he struck the water, he had just seen Elijah strike that river, and the waters parted, and he said, where is the God of Elijah? And God moved. He could have mourned. He could have quit. He could have said, I don't see any reason to keep going. God took him. I don't know what else to do. But instead, Rachel keeps making the decision every Sunday to get up here comes early when half of us are still in the bed or sitting there in our, our uh, cute little bunny socks and our robe eating a, uh, some kind of granola bar if you're healthy, watching Jimmy Swagger or some program, Gardendale Baptist, whatever. And she's coming here and she's committed herself to serve the king because she's striking that water one more time and saying, God, where's the God of my father? because I know you're going to move just like you did. Colton Penrod lost his daddy way, way too early in life. He's older than Rachel was. 
But man, that guy was, we loved his daddy. Brother Shane Penrod, I cannot tell you the times I remember him just standing and raising his hands. A lot of times he'd sit about right there. And he'd raise his hands and tears would go down his face. He just had a heart of gold. Holy Ghost would move on, Brother Shane Penrod, many times. But when he left us in that accident and it crushed so many people as far as their hearts, Colton Penrod had to make a decision. He could take the mantle that had been placed on him, that anointing that his daddy had prayed so many times would be on his son. And he could say, I'll just turn it into a mantle of mourning. I'll just, I'll just sit down and maybe God will bless through somebody else. Or he could do what he does week after week. They were making, I say making fun, they love you, Colton, but the youth were kind of making fun today, and they were getting up here, and they were doing like Colton does sometimes. It, it's because they love you. You know what Colton's doing? He might not even think of this, but when he hears this message, he'll realize what's happening. Every time he goes to stomping and shouting, and he exhorts you when he could have been sitting on a pew somewhere, letting somebody else be youth pastor, let somebody else be on a praise team, let somebody else deal with these crazy kids we got around here. He, he could have uh, took that attitude, but instead he said, I'm going to step into an area where I wasn't prepared for. I wasn't prepared to handle the death of my daddy, but I was prepared to follow my Jesus in spite of anything that I would face. And every time that Colton gets up behind this pulpit, see, he's been through some pain that some of us will never, hopefully, never relate to. Some pain and some hurts and things that I hope you never have to face. But yet, even when sometimes he's getting cold stares back at him, he's up here inflamed with the power of the Holy Ghost. Because he made a decision, I'll take this mantle, and I'll strike the waters, and I'll declare, where is the God of Shane Penrod? Where is the God of my father? Where's the God of my daddy when I saw the Holy Ghost move upon him? Where's the God of my father and my mother when I saw the power of Pentecost begin ripping through the family and moving and changing an entire service because of the anointing on their very lives? You've got to make a decision, church. We're either going to sit here in our pity and talk about how pathetic this presidential election is going to be and how we have no choice and how the morals are going to the pits, how our kids are pretty much living in Sodom and Gomorrah, and a lot of that is, uh-oh, true. And you've heard me say this before. We can say, man, I sure wish my mama and my papa all were still on this earth. I'm fed up with crazy people. I miss having people. I, I, man, I sure wish this was going all over the Internet. Maybe we can do the audio on it. Y'all recording audio? I sure wish I had me some good grandmas and granddaddies that could stand behind me and say, we know which bathroom kids need to go to. And we know which gender a male needs to marry, and we know which gender a female should be marrying. Amen? I miss the old saints who had common sense. Bunch of crazies walking around now. Blows my mind the world that we live in. But here's the thing. I can sit down in a corner with my buddies who believe in holiness and biblical morality and we can gripe among ourselves. And we can talk about the good old days and how we're just so ashamed to be called Americans and we're fed up with the judicial system and can't believe who's going to be voted on as president. And we can sit there and gripe for the next 30 years if Jesus tarries. Or we can stand up and do what our grandparents would have done. We can take the same mantle that they had, my Lord, I feel him, in those old Alabama Holy Ghost count meetings. You know, you hear me talk about Holy Ghost count meeting a lot. I can't help it. It's in my blood. It's in my genetics, in my genes. I saw saints of God who knew what Pentecost was really about. They knew what prayer was really about. I know I preach old school a lot, but it's because that's what we're supposed to be in a lot of ways. Not every way, but in a lot of ways. There's things from the old 
old paths that God says we got my God I feel him we got to get back to digging the old wells my I could talk a little bit about Isaac right now if you ain't careful how that he got the shovel they got the pickaxe they made a decision we're going to dig up some wells of my daddy Abraham because the enemy has stuffed it full of bones of the old animals animals that's been killed they took dung that's what they called it they took dirt and they put all this mess on top of the blessing oh but they pulled out a shovel and they made up their minds I might get a little dirty people might not think that it's a good idea but if it was good enough for my daddy it's good enough for me if it's good enough for the old time saints it's good enough for 2016 my lord the children that were standing up here this morning they don't need to see cold dry bones sitting in the pews they need to see the hot fire of the holy ghost and the only way it's going to happen is if it happens through you Woo, my God, I thank you for the Holy Ghost. Mm, where is the God of Elijah? You know what God did? I've already told you, but God split that water for Elisha just like he did for Elijah. There are some miracles that the church is about to experience in these last days. We thought that things were awesome back in the 50s. I wasn't alive, but I've heard the stories. And we saw how God moved and how he intervened. But I'm here to tell you right now, when the darkness gets stronger, when the evil begins to grow, God's got a plan on the back burner. He's got some little 12-year-old kid that's going to get a touch of Pentecost, and they're going to light a fire in the midst of a meth house they're gonna get in the middle of a place that's so plagued with alcoholism but when that 12 year old boy begins speaking in other tongues it's gonna shake some devils out of that house and that child's gonna say where is the god of elijah Woo, my god i thank you for the holy ghost somebody just give god some praise right now he's here in this room right now god is here Oh, Jesus, I thank you for your anointing. But more than your anointing, I thank you for your presence. Oh, hallelujah. You know what should be the most popular program in your church? Get ready, newsflash, prayer meeting. So, Pastor, I thought it'd be when we had revival or when we scheduled a fellowship dinner or some class we hold. No, prayer meeting should be the most popular event in your church. When we get together and we start seeking the Lord before Sunday, a church on Sunday nights, Sunday mornings, first Monday of every month, we had the biggest turnout this past month. It seemed like it was around 14 or more. 16. I was so pleased with all of you wonderful people <clears throat> that were able to come be part of that. But prayer meeting should be the most popular, well-attended event that you hold at a church. And when people get the right attitude about serving the Lord, it will be. Where is the God whoo, of Elijah? You ready for some good news, Neil? You about to get it? John chapter 14, verse 12. This is where Neil Watts and everybody else comes in. <clears throat> John 14, verse 12. Jesus spoke these words. Get ready, Brother Penrod. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth, do we have any believers? On me. Mm -hmm. Let me remind somebody right now. Now, Elijah was telling him, you're going to get a double portion, Elisha, if you're with me when I go to the Father, when I get carried away. Oh, don't make me bust into that song. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Get ready. Uh-oh, India. And greater. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And greater works than these shall he do. Why is that, Jesus? Because I go unto my Father. When Elijah went up in a chariot of fire, he let my Lord, somebody's about to get it. He dropped a mantle that was anointed. It had been near the fire. It had been there near that sacrifice. When fire came out of heaven and consumed the sacrifice that was doused with 12 pots of their jars of water. It was there when the prophets of Baal were killed. It was there when the earthquake happened and the winds caused rocks to shatter in the presence of Elijah. And yet in the midst of all that, and through the still small voice, that mantle was there when the voice of 
the word, the all-powerful word of God pass through its fibers and reach the ear canals of the prophet of God. Oh, but then we find out that when Elisha followed Elijah to the last second and he goes up in a chariot of fire, it falls down, the mantle falls down into the hands of Elisha and Elisha received a double portion. According to this scripture, Jesus didn't go up in a chariot of fire. He ascended under his own power. The, the angels even spoke and said, why stand you gazing? These men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing? This same Jesus who went up before you, he shall return in like manner. He was telling us that when Jesus went up, nobody had to coach him how to get out of the, get up in the sky. There didn't have to be a chariot. There didn't even have to be an angel to lift up the right foot and lift up the left. Jesus went up under his own power. But here's what the scripture said in John 14, 12. He was saying that because I'm ascending to the Father, you're going to do greater things than I've ever done. Don't you ask for a double portion. Don't you ask God for a triple portion. You say, dear Jesus, give me everything you're willing to give me. Do whatever you want to do. My God, breathe word into this vessel and I will walk according to thy will. Where is the God of Elijah? Next Sunday, we're going to have a relaunch service. It's going to be a birth of new ministries. There's going to be more organization, greater excellence required of all of us, including myself, in order to carry out the vision God has placed for the awakening and for the greater expanse of New Haven Church of God in this city. We know what it's going to take to get to the next level. It's going to take more prayer, more humility, willingness to submit, work together, be united. And it's going to take somebody who's saying, I'm going to take something from the previous generation that was never meant to die. Their holiness, their values, their righteousness, their, their love for God's word, their desire to meet together and to pray. And we're going to take something from the previous generation, that anointed mantle, and we're going to run to the future with it. Through this obedience, through this obedience, you're going to see a relaunching of a ministry. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about going out into the deep and casting your nets. God's going to spark a fire within the church to get after lost souls. Amen. Stand with me tonight. Woo. Colton and Rachel, I didn't ask your permission to share what I did. I apologize, but I hope that, that the Lord was able to use it in the right context. And thank you for being so kind. Your testimonies mean the world to me. And your service in this church means the world to me. There's a lot of things that many others have been through in this church that we could have talked about also that you've lived through, you've endured, you've overcome. And maybe one day we'll get to some of those stories. But tonight I want to remind you of a mantle that's been dropped, not just to Southside, not just to New Haven, but to anyone that's a believer who will follow God's call. There's an anointing upon you people. There is an anointing on you to break every chain. There's an anointing to cure cancer. <laughs> There's an anointing to cast out devils. And there's an anointing and a boldness to preach the gospel and to reach the harvest. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you for your precious anointing. Lord, I've, I've lived for you too long to think that the anointing's enough. The anointing just accompanies that lifestyle and the gifts and callings and that relationship with you. God, what I'm asking for is a closer walk with you. That your people, Lord, will just be enthralled with your spirit. My God, thank you for the way you have touched us tonight. I ask, Lord, that this church will never look back when it comes to wishing things were the way they used to be, but that God will go forward ushering in the kingdom of God on this earth. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. I pray a special blessing on every family, every person, those who are here and those who weren't able to come touch their bodies bring healing to their their flesh lord if they're sick or hurt bless our people financially 
God, I pray ministry will explode in a good way like we've not seen. We love you. Holy Ghost, I always know you're welcome to move in our services, and we welcome you always. We give you thanks for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise?